So the, uh, the most recent one, which is for April 2019, that is just the raw numbers that were sent over to me by Lieutenant White, um, just came in on Thursday or Friday last week, and I was out of the office Thursday and Friday last week, so I did not forward that to anyone. Just printed it off. <clears throat> um, it's very much in keeping uh, as to what things have looked like in the past. Uh, 297 hours was worked in April by the troopers. Uh, the uh, troopers had some leave time or National Guard time, so um, the contract, if you remember it, Mike, you're new to it. Um, if a trooper is going to be away for a long period of time, they'll put somebody into the spot. If the trooper is just going to be on normal vacation, or in this case, National Guard time, and they're just away for a week, mm -hmm. uh, they just cover that slot uh, with one of the middle sex, the other troopers from middle sex. So they don't plug somebody into that particular hole directly. Uh, there were 44 calls for service in April. Uh, you can see them listed there. Um, and uh, 84 traffic stops, 43 tickets were issued. Um, you can see the tickets that were issued. Uh, of those tickets that are issued, you see the, um, <coughs> the fines that go along with that. The two speeding fines are the only two that will generate any income for us if they were written on municipal ordinances. So I don't know from reading this whether they were, you know, issued on Guptill Road or Newland Flats or Route 100. If it was written on Route 100, um, that's, that will go to the state. But all the others, operation after suspension, uh, use of electronic portable device, which is interesting, they issued 13 tickets for texting or phone calling while driving, which fairly high number for one month. And it's nice to see that they're able, well, so there's actually two of them. It's uh, 13 use of portable electronic device and six texting while driving. So that's 19 tickets that were issued for probably cell phone use. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, and then uh, the registration and inspection. All of those are state law um, violation, violations of state law and the, that money will go to the state. Um, you can see the warnings that were issued and so on and so forth. So um, very much in keeping with what we've seen in the past. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the March one in particular. Um, the nine-month period, uh, July through March, which leaves the 10th month April off, you can see that they responded to 819 calls for service in that nine-month period. Um, and uh, you can see through that, uh, you know, the graph on the third page of when they did some work. Uh, and then there's a listing of the different types of complaints there. I did include on the last page, the very last page of that, um, traffic control income that we've received. We budgeted $2,400 for 2019. To date, we've received a little, almost $1,100. Um, so not quite halfway there. My guess is that the, well, they, they probably won't. I was going to say the auditor may put the $407 that came in in January back to 2018. But because we don't have any uh, records of the tickets, all we're going to do is uh, you know, post the income. So this will probably be all 2019 money. So I will stop there. If you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, Mark <coughs> Matea has 
uh, expressed a willingness to continue putting the graphs together. But as I said, for April, I just, I just saw it today, so I didn't have a chance to get it to him. But I'll send that to him, and he'll put it into the same format that all the others are on, and we'll get it posted on the website. I knew the state was uh, considering up in the fines for cell phone use, texting and whatnot while driving. Um, the average year on the $230 texting while driving, uh, $1,380 divided by six is 230 bucks a lack. Um, <coughs> be curious to know if they, if they did end up raising that, those fines. I haven't, I haven't heard yet whether they did or not. They're still wrangling about paid family leave and <clears throat> minimum wage right now. So those seem to be the two last things they're trying to get put through. And the Democrats in each uh, chamber of the House can't decide which of the two is more important, and they're not compromising either one of them. And who knows? Uh, something will pass, but right now, uh, if the governor vetoed either one, I'm not sure the veto would be sustained, even though the Democrats control everything. So, isn't that a little disheartening? Well, depends on it's how you feel session. about the bill. Spend a whole session trying to accomplish something. In right. Well, any questions, people, comments? Um, the community meetings there, uh, you know, isn't it a one, one monthly community get together there with the police officers? Uh, what are the dates on that? I, I'm not sure. It's gone out of my head. Everett, you must know, don't you? The question is how often we're going to meet the. Yeah. Uh, When's the next one? We're going to get changed to once a month, I think. Thursday. Or once every other month. It's yeah. a Thursday. I think it's the fourth Thursday of the month at six. I'll check and I, I think make sure that I'll email it to you. Yeah. This time of year is hell for me in, in my business and uh, to keep up with all that stuff because I would probably attend them if, they, if I was aware of them. But I'm out, out the door in the morning and don't get back till late. Okay. Um, Yes. So you can go back to the public hearing. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So Steve, this is a public hearing. It is a public hearing. Public hearing. Correct. Okay. So um, you have to uh, officially uh, call a public hearing to order. Call a public hearing to order. Right? Yep. So this is a public hearing on interim signed bylaw amendments, and uh, the members of the Planning Commission are here. We work with uh, Alyssa Johnson, who's also here on this draft. Uh, it was really initiated by Revitalizing Library as a way to assist businesses during the Main Street reconstruction. Uh, it's um, a project that I believe uh, has been done in Brandon quite successfully. And um, the concept is that these are uh, banners that could be placed uh, flat against the facade of uh, businesses. Uh, in the Main Street area, there's a map that's uh, part of this bylaw amendment. It's uh, the third page. And it um, basically mimics uh, most of the designated downtown along North and South Main Street. And it extends all the way down to Depot Beverage. Uh, and on the north all the way up to uh, basically the railroad trestle and takes in all the properties on both sides of Main Street and the side streets. And uh, the concept is that each business could produce a banner 
Um, interim bylaws are good for two years from the date that they're adopted, and then they can be extended for one year. So the time frame coincides well with the reconstruction of Main Street. Uh, we worked with Revitalizing Waterbury to um, come up with uh, some guidelines on what these banners would look like, the size and um, location and the design. So uh, basically the banners could be um, no greater than 16 feet, minimum of two feet by two feet. Uh, as I mentioned, they'd be placed against the facade of the building, uh, one banner per business, and um, they would follow the uh, design guidelines, uh, basically using the uh, brand standards that um, were developed with uh, Muldrow Associates and have been used widely in terms of colors, font, and so on. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, it would be effective through um, for the two-year period, and then um, it would be uh, it could be extended for one year with a vote of the um, of the select board. Um, these would be exempt. So they would not require a zoning permit uh, as long as they follow the guidelines. If for some reason something happens and a banner is too large or it, it doesn't comply, then that becomes an enforcement issue that the zoning administrator would, would take care of. I don't believe that's been any issue. And, and Brandon, um, it would be a program that would, uh, RW would assist with uh, in terms of the development. So we've talked about the area that um, would, this would encompass. And, um, and then there are some uh, banner design guidelines that are on page four. And um, these were developed by uh, Lissa. They, um, this went through the board of Revitalizing Waterbury. So uh, Lissa and Karen worked with the board to get their input. And uh, then there's a page that's um, a sample of different banners. There would be a, an area that would be uh, up to 30% of the banner that um, could have the logo, the, the name, lettering, and so on for the business. You can see there's Proud Flower, it's on Flower Salon, and so on. And uh, those would not have to follow the design guidelines. If the whole idea is to promote the identity of these businesses and um, give them a chance to let people know that they're open, that this is the product that they have to offer and um, and so on. So it's it's pretty basic. It's meant to be part of a program to um, assist businesses and just give one more tool that businesses can use throughout the uh, the reconstruction of Main Street. Is there anybody here to speak about any of the issues here? I don't know if. Um, Alyssa or members of the Planning Commission, if there was anything you wanted to add. Dan. Turn it off. Can you pass that over there, please? I'm sorry. The pad of paper, could you pass it to the other side of the room? A record of everybody is here. Ken, is that mic on? Yeah, just. I don't know. Is it? Yeah. Is it? There's a green light there on the. Right there sounds the like it's on. It is now. Good. All right. Ken Bellow, Chair of the Planning Commission. Um, the only thing that I wanted to add is that, um, uh, as Steve already mentioned, Alyssa came with the idea to the Planning Commission, and we had some discussion about it. And as part of that discussion um, involving Steve, we agreed uh, an interim bylaw seemed to make a lot of sense, um, if for no other reason, because the time frame that you can have an interim bylaw coincides with the expected construction period or reconstruction of Main Street. So it's a good fit uh, in that regard. It also means that you don't have to amend your zoning regulations and then have these things which no longer are applicable be sitting in the men of your sign rec. So this sits as a as its own little standalone thing. Um, and so under uh, interim zoning, the Planning Commission doesn't necessarily have an official role. We are not required to have a public hearing. In fact, we didn't have a public hearing. We had public meetings, as all our meetings are. Um, but um, 
we kind of did the legwork on this with RW and with Steve, and we decided that we would make a recommendation so that you would know that we were in support of it. And it seemed like a good idea. I think for a lot of the businesses, anxiety is likely to be high during the reconstruction. Um, and uh, this is something that businesses feel is helpful. Um, there's, certainly there's going to be enough clutter on Main Street for the next couple of years. So uh, it, seemed like, it seemed like the right thing to do. So those are, those are all of my comments. So I've got a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, it says interim sign bylaw amendments, um, but yet it basically speaks to banners. Um, so I guess out of ignorance, is is a banner just considered a one type of of sign? And I guess the reason I'm asking that is because it says here in one of your paragraphs, banners displayed as freestanding ground signs shall be prohibited. Can you elaborate a little bit on what that might look like, a freestanding banner? Uh, are, we, are we talking about a sawhorse type thing with a... My, in my view, a freestanding banner is a flag. Um, so, but just, uh, you know, on my ordinary life experiences being in the world, so I don't know, you know, what else you would have. And, you know, I think what it would prohibit if somebody decided to take a couple of trash cans and fill them up with trash and put a couple of poles in it, and I'm going to string my banner across it, and we're going to put it out there by the road, then then that would that would cover that that scenario, and so what we're proposing is no, you can't do that. Just put it on the building. So the reason I ask that is I'm just curious. There down the Hender's Bakery, there she's got the little sandwich board. Sandwich board. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's in no way, shape, form. So this is an addition to any Correct. signs that would be allowed under the current regulations. Now, whether Hender's sign is in compliance with our zoning regulations or not, that I don't know. I quit the sign enforcement business about nine months ago. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just curious to know what type of sign that would be in comparison to the banner. And maybe, typically, a, typically maybe Alyssa can sandwich, answer that. Sandwich board sign is what those are typically referred to. Yeah, and they're allowed. They're also exempt. Uh, they're to be taken in at night. Uh, they're yeah. not always taken at night. They can't block the sidewalk. And there's a square so, footage rule on them. Yeah, yeah. correct. Um, eight square feet, and so on. Okay. They can be two sided. They're. <coughs> they can, so you can have both. Yeah. Both of the sandwich board and one of these banners. Awesome. Very good. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Hi everyone, Alyssa, Economic Development Director. Um, one quick note to Chris's point is just one of the reasons we talked about facades is just to cry, try and create some, um, we'll say, equity between businesses along Main Street. So if you have Mark's building, which really the only place you could put a sign is on front of it, versus some folks, you know, farther down South Main who have a nice yard and could really spread things out um, against the building was kind of the level playing field that anyone on Main Street could do. Um, I just wanted to add a quick note of thanks to Steve and the Planning Commission, who amidst a really busy um, unified development bylaw relay, um, have taken multiple meeting times to help um, perfect and add feedback. Um, as was noted by Ken and Steve, this seems like a really appropriate vehicle. Um, and just add some background that this came out of meetings we had um, before there was, you know, shovels in the ground uh, many months ago with just a business owner requesting this and saying that they wanted the ability to have a banner. So while the current regulations do allow that for you know maybe three weeks, um, this was kind of a way to allow this for a longer point. And then also just note that while obviously we couldn't commit you all to saying anything or anything like that, um, I do have over 10 folks who are interested and said that you know if something like this was to pass, they would be um, wanting to sign up. And again, just mirroring Brandon in that by having some guidelines, the goal was to give some flexibility for the messaging that each folks want and you know their own brand standard, but also try and keep things a little consistent throughout town. Thanks. I want to compliment you on the. I want to compliment you on the examples because they definitely um, are attractive and kind of tell the story of how <clears throat> they could um, brighten up the main street during construction. They're they're nice examples. Thank you. And we give a lot of 
Total credit for that. Yeah, I also got together with Bill, and uh, Bill provided some good input about the enactment authority and enforcement. So we had Bill's comments in as well. You reviewed it. So do these have a, like a sunset date when this goes away? Or? Right. So uh, if you enact them tonight, for instance, uh, they will expire two years from mm -hmm. tonight. Right. And then um, if you desire, they can be extended for another year. I believe we have to hold another public hearing. Right, and that's, that's in keeping with what Ken said. Um, the construction is supposed to be 2019 through 2021, so this may expire, we hope, just a few months before the project finishes up, and then one final um, extension to get us over the finish line, and then they'll just automatically retire. Chris? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Just as an example, can you hear me all right? Yep. Bruce B. Olin, attorney at law. Ray Van Voris, doctor of chiropractic. They have both talked to me about taking their existing signs, which are on a post out in the middle of the lawn, which both cases will be affected by the attachment of the sewer line and so forth. Is there any reason they can't take their existing sign and place it on their porch in front or right on the beside of that door with a couple of hooks that just hangs down. I'll have to spend a waste of time and money to do something different. Um, that may be a zoning uh, issue. I think if they're interested in doing that, they should talk to Dina. It may, if a, a sign is going to be relocated, it typically requires a zoning permit. It doesn't mean it can't be done. Uh, signs uh, typically need to be outside of the street right of way or get permission from the select board, uh, like the wine uh, shop sign. So uh, I think the answer to your question is that may very well be an option, but it might it would probably be a different process than this one. Well, my thought would be if we were to inject, which is hard to do today, a little common sense and reality, it probably would work damn well. And I would hope that you would take into advisement Regardless of what the Planning Commission does, or you, Steve, or whatever. So, think about it. If you got any questions, call 8951, send me a text or email, and we'll chat. Thank you. Thanks, Everett. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, just to be certain, uh, <clears throat> while this bylaw authorizes or enables these banners, they do still require permits, right? Um, no, these would no be exempt, right. correct. Um, like the banner that uh, Alyssa mentioned for three weeks, they're exempt. We want to make this process okay. as simple as possible. Good. Then in that case, it certainly seems that what Everett was talking about would be nice if you can do that. So I'm not saying that you can. I'm just saying it would be nice to allow that sign to be put up on the building you know, on the front porch as opposed to having to go to the expense and have a banner made. So that's, right. that's not, that's just okay. my comment. You don't have to answer it. Okay, that sounds I, I would agree with that. I don't think a taxpayer business should be, if they have an existing sign and they want to hang it on their, you know, porch or something like that, should be, have to go through another zoning process, you know, because it's really, it's, the whole process is really due to the, the big thing. And, um, you know, I, I just think they shouldn't have to, one, make a new sign, and two, you know, it shouldn't be at any cost to them. Hmm. Personally. Well, I think you probably have to also take into consideration whether or not, if they made that change, if they'd want to go back to put it on the original positioning on the, on the lawn afterwards. Right afterwards, yeah, right. if that could be a condition of the... So this would be the existing ground sign? Is, is that the, the idea? That's what he's talking about. Yeah. Okay, right. and, and relocating that. Okay. Now, I don't know if, if it's too late to make an amendment, or even, well, if, even if we could even do that. Well, let me just to speak to this. Um, yeah. the, the existing ground signs uh, were all inventoried as part of the Main Street reconstruction projects. The ones that were in the right of way and needed to be relocated. Uh, agreements were reached with the owners. In some cases, there was funding provided right. to relocate right. relocate the sign. So I'm, I'm reluctant to add language in here that 
um, involves moving uh, permitted, um, permanent so-called signs. I think you know, we can certainly work with Dina to try to facilitate a process if, if someone does want to do that and make it as easy as possible. But I, I really would prefer to keep it separate from this process just because uh, it's different. part of the project. Yeah, yeah, the signs are very integral to the Main Street project. Understood. OK. Um, last question, and it kind of pertains. You said you had 10 people possible that were interested in the banners. <clears throat> I know it's a little early stage, but uh, have you gotten any input, pro or con, as to how the project, the reconstruction projects, affecting anybody? And, you know, it's, we're still early into it, but. I think generally folks are appreciative of, as I think we all are, or I personally am Jay McDonald's approach and where they did start, but I do also want to emphasize there are certainly businesses in that area, um, Barb Fars and myself, but especially Barb, everyone's done a great job um, being really accommodating and working with folks. Um, I do have one business that's pretty uh, walk-in, driver-by, pass-by centric, so to speak, and um, that's the one with the most impact. The rest tend to be more the service providers. Um, and fortunately, they have kind of established clientele and folks have you know, just planned a little extra time and been okay to get in. Um, so you know, short of that one particular business that had expressed concerns um, overall, you know, aside from just some inconvenience um, in terms of business revenues, folks have been okay as far as I'm aware in this section. Um, and just to go back to the banner note, I would also note this is additional signage, so whatever gets determined about the pole banner side in front, in like best case scenario, you could have your you know, sign that you've always had plus a new one, uh, so just more. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll recuse myself. And then I, I was basically gonna say the same thing. I think most of us who have businesses through this corridor have designed our signs to basically maximize the amount of square footage that we were allowed. This gives us an opportunity. I have a feeling a lot of them are just gonna say open during construction or something like that to just give a little bit more of a, please know that even though you can barely see my building that we are open. So I think this is a really nice opportunity, especially not having to go through uh, additional permitting and just know that as long as you follow the guidelines, you can make these signs. I think that's a really important thing for businesses. So I think that's what this is. Separate that idea that this has anything to do with their normal signs and the rules associated with this. This is just in addition to for the two, two years that we're going to be dealing with the difficulty of being in business during the construction. I think probably through the construction process that these banners would be one of the least ugliest things to be looking at. <laughs> <laughs> so unless there's uh, any more comments or question, Ann. Typo on page uh, two, effective three, third line, select for that in May two, effective May Right, that, that should be May 20th on page two, under effective period. I want copies What's that, Everett? Anyone want to see? Yeah, this is the third line on the second page. Um, I also made note of that. Uh, it should be read May 20th, 2019. I just left out the zero there. Well, if everybody else is all set, looks like we are, I can take a motion to approve the uh, interim Signed bylaw amendments for May 20th. That's also on the front of the top of the page. Uh, I'll that, make a motion. That amendment for, yeah, to change that to May 20th. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a motion that the interim sign, <clears throat> signed bylaw amendment is effective as of this date, May 20th, 2019. I second the motion. Further discussion? Like everybody's happy. All those in favor of approving, say aye. 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 Good, thank Enough. you. Yeah, we warned them on May 2nd, so that was part of the confusion. The, the draft was dated May 2nd because that's when the warning went out. That's what Bill and I agreed on, but it will definitely, the adopted version will say May 20th, so. Michael. There's, I don't know, Steve may be the best one to answer this. A lot of communities I know when they have kind of projects like this, a lot of times at the entrance to the community they have 
you know, like, it looks like almost DOT type signs that, you know, such and such businesses are, you know, open during construction. I've seen that in various projects. Um, it's usually towns of similar size to ours. Do you know if that? Yeah, I know Barry had signs on Summer Street and so on. Right. I think uh, there's a committee that's met. Um, Alyssa, um, there's some signage with maps that are going to go up. Is that right? Like near uh, the reservoir, between the reservoir and yes, that was and the more Gullipetti. my understanding of the trans project specific, kind of showing the segments and the timeline. Um, right. We have had that discussion, but I'll make an addition to follow up. We haven't talked about flashing, but just larger listed side. There was some, my understanding is like AOT thing about they can say businesses but not names because then that gets into advertising. But yeah. we'll see if we can. Yeah, we have to be out. careful. <laughs> Could you put a banner that just says something generic, like, like I mean, a colored banner like this that would yeah. be kind of eye-catching that might be like, Waterbury, we're open for business, or something like that? Yeah. We could possibly do something on the banner poles. That might be a yeah. possibility. We could talk to work with Bill around that. Some kind of a catchy little yeah. phrase or logo or something. OK. I from Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got to be careful about that yeah. with the artwork. <laughs> Anything thank else? you, Steve. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Nice job. Thank you, planners. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, gonna, oh, that's right, too. I'll, I'll take a motion to uh, end the uh, public meeting, please. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Request for a memorial bench. You have a letter there. You can come up here if you'd like. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I just need that. No problem. Okay. Must be Chris. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm, my name is Chris Kaliba. I'm a resident of Waterbury Center. Uh, been a resident for about three years now. Been before that I was from Duxbury. So uh, I am here on behalf of the friends and family of Eli Brookins. Um, as many of you likely know, Eli was one of the uh, young people that was taken from our community in uh, in the fall of 2016. Uh, you're likely also in the news right now. It's, it's going through uh, the trial phase and what have you. Uh, a number of memorials have been established for the youth, um, mostly grounded at the high school. Um, those youth have been memorialized as a collective. Um, obviously, we've seen the five stars, um, the holiday period, um, Deeply and a lot of deep remembrances. There have been scholarship funds and other memorials set up for some of the other uh, youth uh, that lived in the valley. Um, and the thought that has emerged from um, the family and friends group for Eli as being the, the sole um, young person who's taken from our community here in Waterbury, Waterbury Duxbury. Um, was to consider uh, a memorial uh, for him um, that would have a lasting um, remembrance for Eli um, here in the community. Um, Eli was a pretty special young man. Uh, Eli was uh, an, one of the best athletes we've probably seen come through our, our community in a very long time. Uh, he played baseball on these fields. Um, and he also played uh, soccer and was an avid soccer player, uh, went through uh, Waterbury Rec programs, um, and was a star on, uh, on our high school team, um, and uh, was memorialized uh, during his time as being um, a mentor to youth, to being a role model, to being a young man that gave 200%, not 100%, but 200% to the pursuit of what he 
what he undertook. Um, and again, another thing that really stands out is his mentoring. He looked and supported young people and inspired them. And his memory um, would, would do that, uh, a memorial to inspire him, would inspire our youth. So what we are proposing is that the select board consider, uh, and, the, and the town, consider uh, a memorial uh, remembrance for him on town property. Uh, given his connection to this piece of land out here and the amount of time that he spent, um, the amount of joy that he had um, during his time on these fields, uh, we're proposing that uh, a memorial bench and perhaps a, an heirloom tree um, be planted in a location that is uh, amenable to the, the town and the public works department. Uh, our intention is to raise all funds to um, uh, build the bench, identify the bench and the tree, um, and for the installation of that. Um, we are not anticipating a high maintenance uh, remembrance, uh, no flowers, no annuals, um, and what have you. Um, the family has some thoughts about possible locations, but we would be open to working with the Public Works Department and others to, to cite it in a spot that makes the most sense. Um, the current thinking is uh, perhaps along the ridge line here on the, on the berm above, um, overlooking the fields. Um, but other possibilities would be there. I understand, obviously, when you're considering these, these things, um, Probably there's two criteria at least. One is um, the exceptionalism of the person that would be memorialized as a community, outstanding community member, and I would, I would hope we would all agree that he fits that bill. And if we're, if you're needing some further evidence, I'm sure we've got many more folks that would be happy to share some remembrances of Eli and his legacy. Um, secondly, obviously, is the cost, the cost to the town. Um, we have very good sense to it through, uh, we haven't started the fundraising because we want to get the green light from you, but we would do a, a GoFundMe uh, project as well as a community event that would probably raise additional, additional resources. So we're anticipating that we'll raise more, more than enough money to, uh, to build this, um, this remembrance. Um, so with that, I submitted letters to all of you. Um, as well as Bill Woodruff, and I've had a brief chat with Bill, and Bill said go through these channels. But um, I'd be happy to chat more with Bill and find out from his, his crew what the concerns or uh, needs would be for us to, to, to proceed. So I, I thank you for the opportunity, and I'm happy to, uh, to respond and, and answer any questions. Any sense of what the bench would be constructed out of? Um, the, the idea would be it would be constructed of um, wood, that, like, a, like a cedar or a hemlock, um, something that would be durable, sealed. Um, we could do a pressure treated as well. Um, if you have other, other thoughts, I mean, if wrought iron is more durable, um, it would likely be a little more expensive, but we can pursue that. Um, we have a number of woodworkers in the, in the community that we're considering approaching with helping us with the design. But certainly uh, weatherproofed, something that would last and be durable, it would certainly be something that we would want to consider. Yeah, we would consider granite, too. I think a lot of them are made granite. out of granite. I know the cost is up there, but um, yeah. a lot of those are made out of granite. Okay. Rock of Ages might be willing to work with you. Good. Realizing, you know, the impact this had in... You yeah, know, not just our community, but as Vermont as a whole. Exactly. Thank you. Everett, I think this is a, a great idea. Uh, I'm going to get a few people to handle the Zephanel. It's a great idea. He was a fine young man. Uh, actually, one of my son in laws was the assistant coach at Howard. And uh, uh, I just was curious if you can go back in your minutes and see what the guidelines were when it, Brian Linder's son had the bench put up in the town uh, in the park there. And there's another bench there, which I don't know who that is, just if I happen to walk out there and look at it. But there may be some guidelines from there that would follow this. I agree with Mark Fryer that uh, 
granted, it's more expensive, but it's also not going right away. Or the maintenance on it would be pretty pretty minimal, but whatever. Right. I can't imagine you won't get contributions. Yeah, we would definitely be, look, be willing to look into that for sure. So you went back and looked at what uh, Ryan's situation was and the other one up there in the town. Might give you some insight into what you might want to do here. Um, I can speak to one of those two benches because I was involved <clears throat> um, over 15 years ago, I guess, uh, with um, a group of people putting in a memorial bench to um, our neighbor, Emily Mateyer, who was a wonderful daycare provider for lots of families in Waterbury Center. And I think... Um, and we we very we're, we're very happy to raise the money and put the bench in. Um, I think I have some concerns I, or some uh, requests that the town come up with some guidelines for uh, benches of this type because what's happened to that particular bench, which is in the little green um, in front of the Grange there, the center green, is that it had a um, a crushed stone kind of um, drainage underneath the bench, but and then a couple of marble slabs, but they've sort of settled. And now that it's been a number of years, one of the legs of the bench is starting to list a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, it's an awkward situation because you have some private citizens that put the bench in. The town didn't put it in. It's not really their responsibility. Uh, one of the three people in charge has moved out of town, so we're, we've just been discussing, actually, um, myself and one of the other people involved, how we're going to fix the situation. So, um, so I guess um, that highlights that we, I think it's time that we come up with some guidelines and, and uh, whatever they may be, staff, um, because we've had a number of requests or, or memorial benches put in, and, and um, uh, I, I think stone is a great idea, but this gives you an, just an example of one that was well-intentioned and, and looked great when it was just put in, but now over time. It needs a better footing or foundation that went down to frost, so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I mean, I'm supportive, but I think the town needs to come up with some guidelines. Thanks. <coughs> Also, regarding the tree, I'm on the Waterbury Tree Committee. Steve Lodsbeach acts as the tree warden, so I think it would be terrific to work with Steve and, and that group. Um, some expertise on picking sure. a tree, the right kind of tree. Uh, I happen to be a landscape architect, so I have some thoughts on that myself. Yeah. Thanks. Bill? Well, I, I just was going to say what, what Jane did. Um, I know the bench that Everett talked about, uh, we did give permission to uh, the Linda family to put that in. Um, my recollection is that the family basically designed it, said this is what they wanted. The same thing happened with the Mater bench. The same thing happened with the bench for um, Paul, Reed. Paul Reed out here that we allowed it to go, but, uh, but I, I concur with Jane. I think if we're going to do this, we need two things, one more important than the other. One is a, a design kind of criterion that, because it really, if we're gonna let it be put into our facilities, once it's installed, maybe the town should be responsible for it at that point, if we're gonna let it be put in. I don't think it's reasonable to ask people 15 years down the road to, you know, come up with money for, for something. Um, and the second thing I mentioned, and, and I'm not arguing in this case, I think this is a perfectly appropriate uh, request, um, but there should be some criterion as to who we're going to do this with. Uh, you know, what are the circumstances when we'll when we'll install a memorial bench. Um, for here, I was interested that you said up here on the, the banking. I think really at this field, that's really the only place we can do it. Um, the bench, if it's going to be permanent at all, we have issues with floods. Mm -hmm. We certainly don't want ice right. flowing through and knocking the thing over. Uh, the same thing with a, with a tree would be potentially damaged. So. 
if we're going to find a spot for it, if if the family and friends really want it to be at this facility, mm -hmm. I think um, here on Main Street, um, or it could be at the other end, but it's much less visible there. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're going to put it here, we'll just have to make sure that we situate it such that it doesn't get damaged by sidewalks, mm -hmm. snow plows, and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. How quickly, before you ask your question, Mike, I mean, uh, how quickly are you thinking that you... So we could be raising the money within the matter of two months or so. Um, there is a, a desire among the family to, to at least do something uh, in terms of a remembrance. His, uh, Eli's sister is uh, going away for international study um, in the fall. and. The other thought that I would have is, is something that would counter some of the little negative tastes that people are feeling right now. So something within the next ideally few months, I understand the need for getting regulations in place to sustain these kind of projects. Um, my sense would be for different load bearings of different types of benches that there's fairly straightforward engineering approaches that shouldn't be terribly difficult to figure out. No, but. I just think, I think it's actually an opportunity. You're right. coming here is kind of an underscores, it's an opportunity for us to, sure. to, to take this seriously yeah. and, and deal with it, because we've talked about it before, but it was a couple of years ago. And, it, and I think we can come up with design criteria, and we can have, you know, more than one design that right. is right. that is acceptable to us, so that way every single one doesn't have right. to be a carbon copy. But uh, I'll work with with Steve and Bill Woodruff on this. Um, if you go ahead and approve, then you can start your fundraising anytime. I Great. would imagine. Okay. But, so can we just uh, make a motion to approve based on final design and placement? Okay, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the memorial bench for Eli Brookins, um, pending final design and placement criteria. I second that. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Is there further discussion? I Mike? just wanted to follow up to Bill's comment. Um, I do think in terms of the second comment, and this is no, I think, the person memorialized mm -hmm. is very just, but I think I'm more concerned when I first read this is my concern was can any Tom, Dick, and Harry, you know, you know, and there has to be either some criteria or maybe just it comes before the select board. Simple if we think it meets meets that test. I don't know if we could come up to, you know, a test of what people do to be memorialized, but I think this is a very worthy but i think in the future you could have my my dog kitty you know yeah. well and coming up with the criterion that you're going to measure it by is a lot easier than when somebody's sitting in front of you asking <laughs> and then you decide no you're not worthy you right. know? so having the criteria in place right. you can always overrule it if you want but, well uh, we could also with a little time maybe look at some other communities that probably are some guidelines out there yeah, I'd just like to put this out on the table, too, just to kind of stick in your head a little bit. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, guidelines also need, need to reflect the consideration for how much of this in the future will take place. Um, at some point, it could start to impact the, the facilities themselves and, and what they were intentionally meant for, you know? Um, so it's just something that you need to keep in our minds there as we uh, move forward with this. Mm -hmm. But uh, as well, we're, we're the, we're the uh, okay. effort here. So, All right. uh, that being said, there's been a motion made and seconded. Are there any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Have the family and friends, thank you. And we'll work with you, Bill, and okay. the other Bill and Steve, and uh, appreciate you making the affordances here. And uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And will you be the contact person? I will be the now? contact, yes. Okay. Thanks. I'll reach out to you. Um, so at the beginning, you folks approved the consent agenda. 
which included the liquor license, which I forgot to send around and before Carla gets a chance to scold me. Please, <laughs> please sign that. I was going to ask you about that, Bill. safe now, Bill. Okay, manager's items. Uh, discussion about cannabis. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> One of my not-so-favorite subjects. Well, because you've talked to me about it, uh, it's part of the reason why it's on here tonight. Um, just a, an update as to what's going on in the legislature, and I'm not a... Uh, authority on the subject in terms of its negotiation through the legislative process, but I did have a town and city management um, conference on Thursday and Friday, and uh, the folks from VLCT gave a legislative update to let us know where all the bills of interest for the municipalities across the state stood, and, and we had a lot of discussion. Um, this one came up and um, I thought it would be helpful for you to know what things look like right now. So as you remember, it was a year ago when the legislature allowed uh, possession of marijuana and you could grow plants. I don't remember how many and I don't remember how much, but um, you can grow plants um, and, and possess a certain amount of of marijuana for your own consumption. Um, there has been numerous cases uh, documented around the state, uh, a couple here in Waterbury that, that I had to pass along to law enforcement where, where people were saying, you know, come and stay at my bed and breakfast and, you know, pay $40 to park and as a, you know, a parting gift, you'll get some. Uh, marijuana. Uh, that is not legal. Uh, they, were, they were saying they weren't selling it, they were just giving it away as part of some other business promotion. So the law enforcement agencies have been dealing with that issue across the state. Um, there was talk this year that uh, uh, tax and regulate uh, bill might be introduced and might be passed where pick, pick your state, uh, you know, Colorado, Massachusetts, places that allow for sale and taxation of marijuana. Um, it does not appear that that is going to pass this year. Um, there's still too many things up in the air. Uh, the governor has been very adamant that he wants some type of road roadside testing. There's been a lot of discussion about this saliva test and the efficacy of it, uh, whether it you know, tells you anything or not. Um, but it does not appear that this is going to uh, come to pass. What has become clear is that um, if it is taxed and regulated, they will set up a, a a new agency or a new division to do the regulation. They will not put it under the Department of Liquor Control. And my speculation is they don't want it to go under the Department of Liquor Control for two reasons. One, um, the state is in the business of selling liquor. Um, and I don't think the state wants to be in the business of selling marijuana because right now it's not legal on a federal basis. So state doesn't want to put the regulation of this under the Department of Liquor Control because um, uh, they don't want to have anything to do with it as a middleman, so to speak, 
like they are with, with liquor. Um, the other thing that it's, it's not an absolute right now, but the committees that have had jurisdiction over this, the judiciary committees, uh, I imagine, have suggested that um, it, if they proceed next year the way that the leadership is talking about now, is that it will be uh, available for consumption, for purchase, taxation and consumption statewide, uh, everywhere. And municipalities will have to opt out if they don't want to allow it in their communities. So as opposed to um, you know, what some thought was more likely going to happen, that it would be uh, regulated through a taxable um, transaction, that towns would have to opt into it. It seems the direction it's going now, uh, and this can all change, of course, is that uh, the direction it seems to be going now is that this will be legal unless the voters in your community say it won't be legal. Uh, and that's a very different hurdle or bar to climb. So um, there's no action that you need to take now. I'm not here to say you should or sh should do this or that, but I think that um, if this usually, if bills pass during the legislative session, they become effective July 1st in the year that they're passed. Now, it could be that they decide, say, that this passes at the end of next year's legislative session. They may say this will be effective uh, July 1st, 2021, January 1st, 2021. Normally, a bill that passes in, in the legislative session now will go into effect July 1st of the year it passes. So if you want to have conversations about this, discussions about this, you ought to have, you ought to start thinking about what you want to talk about uh, before too long, I think. Because if you wait until the last minute and it passes and it's available July 1st, then you don't have a lot of time to act. And again, I'm just giving you this as information. It's not to suggest you do one thing or the other, but I thought it would be helpful for you to know where things stand right now and what things look like from the perspective of VLCT at this point. Chris? Yes, sir. Didn't the city of Newport, through the city council, vote to not allow the sale of ropes and et cetera? City of Newport's ordinance speaks to medical marijuana dispensaries, Everett. Okay. And up until now, I mean, the, there's been no ability to regulate, um, to say anything about the, the uh, prohibition or the uh, allowance of retail sales of recreational marijuana because that's not allowable by state law yet. And I think that's why the folks at the League of Cities and Towns brought this to our attention on Friday last week is because, as I just said, if, if this gets into the process next year and it passes and it's a done deal and you can buy it anywhere on July 1st, it's, it's hard to do otherwise. So I just want the board to be aware of it so you can start formulating your own questions, whether it's an issue you want to talk about with the public here or not, that's, that's your choice. So is there any discussion on the regulation of retail venues that it will be available, or can the place where you buy your beer, you buy your weed, and the place where you buy your groceries has weed, and you know? It, it, I, I think it, I think it will be more prescribed than that. I think that you know, you'll have to get a license uh, from the state. I don't think it's going to be you can go to any, you know, mom and pop hardware store and buy it. Uh, I, right. I don't believe that's the case now. But well, I mean, Vermont has got some pretty loose laws. I mean, we now have a hardware store in Plainfield where you can get a pint. So 
<laughs> so, <laughs> um, that would be concerning to me that if it was that widely distributed. As, as is beer, as is wine in this state, you can pretty much buy it anywhere. Yeah, but it changes when you get into liquor, and I have a feeling they're going to control it a lot closer to how they control liquor, where it's a very few right. people have licenses to do that. The, the big difference being that they control the inventory of the liquor as a state, where here I would expect them to have a, what they've been doing with medical marijuana is they've kind of been picking regions. I don't know how they would do it to make it fair here, and I would expect to see significantly more licenses than they currently have for medical, but it's a, it's a rather arduous, arduous and expensive process just to get the licensing, to get those permits, and then I would expect to see, similar to how other states have done it, where they're pretty much wholly their own venue um, I don't think, I, I'm not sure I, if I know of any state that's doing what you're talking about where it would just be in the mix of other things yet. Right. That's how I right. <laughs> believe it's proceeding as well, that there'll be certain restrictions. I, but I know from, at least from Colorado's um, examples, uh, you know, it's a very cash intensive business because nobody. Uh, <coughs> Nobody's going to loan you money if it's a federal, you know, if it's not approved federally um, to have a, a retail dispensary. You know, you have to pretty much be a cash business. Yeah, I heard a, st I heard a report about Massachusetts that initially they were, there were a lot of, um, there was a th thinking that this was going to be a, a good thing for a small businessmen or you know people who business people uh, who it could it could, it could be a good business for a wide diversity of people and what's actually happened was it's it's only people who have a lot of money or access to a lot of funds and security that they can get into this business yeah, that's so it's pretty much why. just what you're saying it's pretty much rules out the little guy they're, they're not making any money off of this at all and so I think the towns had planned for it to be more widespread and what's actually happened is the opposite mm -hmm. yeah the uh, so people are feeling kind of like they got chipped like sort of disenfranchised they went and did all this planning and then it's, it hasn't worked out that way. And from what I understand, and I won't get the numbers right, um, the fairly high tax level that they're talking about now, and uh, it was interesting that they had um, initially proposed that any town that sold it would get a tax of 2%. Uh, they quickly cut that to 1%. Um, uh, I'm not saying that it's worth it, but it was interesting that, you know, that, that uh, they, they're, they're looking a lot at how much is in this for the state as well. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Where was that cut to 1%, Bill? That was in the, the draft legislation okay. that was moving through this year. But, of course, nothing passed, so it's kind of moot. It will, um, it will be taken back up next year in the second year of the... By any so. Um, of course, this probably gets under my skin more so than most people. Um, I've seen the impact of this uh, with different people that I'm associated with in my lifetime that, um, quite honestly, hasn't benefited them. Uh, it ruins, in my opinion, it ruins a person's motivation and drive to want to be, do anything, uh, have any aspirations or be successful in anything in life. Um, and it just, it's another thing for society to be, um, I don't know what the right word is, uh, Sidetracked, um, you know, just a, a, another reason for them not to pay attention in life, and uh, I don't know, probably stepping over a line here, but 
not not giving themselves a right to be there, have their full potential. Um, and for me, I thought that the uh, legislative report there that I read was a little bit over heavy-handed by our state legislators. Um, basically, you will allow this to happen in your community no matter what. Now, it sounds like they may be adjusting that a little bit. Um, uh, well, there was a... Given, given the town some form of opt-out based on voter approval or disapproval. Right. As I understand it, there was um, fairly... Um, the, f the first legislation talked about if, if you want to do it, you had to opt in. That it was prohibited unless you voted to do it. That has now been flipped where it's allowed unless you vote against doing it. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a significant change because it's not, you know, the first way, it's not available anywhere unless some town decides to do it. This way, if it goes through as they're suggesting now, it will be allowed everywhere unless the town says no. So anyway, there, there's no, I mean, you can talk about it all you want tonight. My intention wasn't to put this on tonight to have a big debate about the pros and cons of it. Uh, we all have our own personal feelings, I'm sure. I just wanted you to understand that right now it's looking like the opt-out will be the way it will be introduced next year. And if it's going to be allowable as of July 1st, you know, the time is short. So right. keep your eyes and ears open. Well, I'm just wondering if there was anything that we could do to f forward a letter to our representatives to uh, encourage them to give towns at least some say as to whether or not we want it as part of our community. Um, isn't, isn't that what they're doing? They're basically saying, either way, you have an option. Well, I'm just wondering if there should be a little bit of reinforcement from from the town, at least our town. I don't, you know, other towns can speak for themselves, but they're going to do what they do do up there on their own unless they hear from from us, from the different towns, encouraging them one way or the other. And uh, I mean, I don't know how the rest of the board members feel about this type of thing. Um, I'll give you a for for example. Today I was up looking at a project where um, the foundation was was getting put into uh, the project and I just happened to arrive at lunchtime and uh, the last thing that happened before the workers, one of the workers went back to work and there was only two of them is he had a dope pipe stuck in his mouth and he was sucking the air through that thing like there was no tomorrow, it was his last breath. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the thing. It's uh, this this definition of recreational has become basically full time, and I hear it from employers all over uh, in the construction world that uh, their their acceptance of this type of thing has uh, escalated because it's become the norm, and that's just you know from a liability standpoint, from an insurance liability standpoint. I don't know how that uh, affects companies if something should happen to one of those workers, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'll come out and say that I think it should be taxed and regulated. I think it sh it's similar to how alcohol, I mean, like, you wouldn't want an employer or employee to be sitting there drinking a bottle of vodka before they get behind a piece of equipment either. So I think that, you know, that's that's on a lot of ways the employer to start to learn to create their own rules but I think the opportunity here is a the taxation of it the regulation of it for safety reasons but also just to start to own the supply chain I think right now before I, I personally believe that it will eventually be federally legal and you're starting to see similar to the tipping point of alcohol back in the prohibition era that as the states are, the, sta the tipping point's happening, but the opportunity here is that Vermont could own its entire supply chain, which those mean jobs. Those can also mean rural jobs. So I think we have to really talk through why we as a community would say no to this, because 
the money is just going to go up the street or down the street. I, I don't, I personally think it's not, no more dangerous than alcohol, and alcohol is a business that I'm in and a lot of other people partake in, and I think that it just needs regulation and rules, um, but I don't think we should necessarily consider not um, strongly considering the options around it. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that you'll ever beat the underground market? I think Something the like this. danger there is the tax rate. I think the tax rate can either help to eliminate the underground market or keep it strong and alive. Call me a libertarian, which I feel I am, <laughs> but I do think whether it be marijuana, whether it be booze, whether it be other stuff, it's all personal responsibility that pe people take. And I think towns may be off if, if you know, there are some towns that are going to take advantage of it. And it could be you know, financially viable. There are farmers who are growing it. And I think for people who use it responsi responsible, I don't have a real problem with it. Those who don't use it responsibly, you, you know, there should be you know, consequences. Just like you say, you know, if you have employees who are using drinking or smoking dope, you know, you have to make a decision on whether you want to keep them as employees. But I think our town, really, we have to look at what the consequences are by going, not allowing uh, the sale of cannabis, you know, in our community, because there are going to be potentially some entrepreneurs that can make some money out of it. And, and also, it's, it's, it's a legal way. It, it gets people out of, you know, the, the corners buying, you know, drugs. I think there are a lot of people who probably would like to just, like, buying a bottle of booze. And I think there are a number of people who do use it responsible. You know, I, I, I think there should be an outlet for them. So it, it isn't a very emotional thing, and maybe it's something we're going to have to wrestle with. Well, I'm sure I'd probably stand pretty much alone on the way I feel about this, but uh, you know, I totally, totally uh, understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. but, uh, okay. Well, I think we have we have a little time to plan, and um, I think we need to be smart. Look what's happened in some other communities. There are unknowns, but there are also some examples of the way things have gone, so. I guess my bigger concern is out of the 80 people that are responsible, there's 20 that aren't, and the 20 always impact somebody else. Uh, and that's where I kind of, I kind of go off the deep end. Ever. In today's free press, is not a call from Maine. And I don't recall if it was the lady governor or some counselor, but they said they were looking at it and trying to not get involved with the mistakes that have been made in Colorado and some of the other states. And the other thing that concerns me is when it, uh, we have the likes of the lieutenant governor spending some time at a local restaurant, bar, etc., participating in the great event and probably without a doubt, on that particular weekend, every marijuana law was broken, and there's nobody and no way to control it. And there could be others in other restaurants in the Waterbury area. Uh, one of our appointed individuals, who was here this evening, said it was something that would bring some money into our community. Well, if we're that bad off, uh, I don't think we ought to be looking at that. And it's also, from my perspective, and I saw it in my years of ambulance, 6.31 in the morning, we responded to a call on Randall Street where a person had been taking cocaine the night before in that morning. And in my amateur questioning capability, his wife finally admitted and went and got the cocaine and brought it out to me. He was an employee of the state of Vermont, and uh, he got reported to them and he still continued to have his job and nothing went on. This past weekend, I think it was last Saturday and Sunday, wasn't there a, an event at uh, Champlain Valley Exposition for people to go and learn how to raise hemp and numerous and sundry other things. Yeah. It's just another step on the way to becoming an addict 
in my opinion, and there's been some articles in the Free Press recently of three females, I think it was, that have finally come to reality, common sense, and they're now on the way to recovery. And one of the people said that she would never want to be that way again. So it's nothing that's easy for you as select board members, but the general public, unfortunately, uh, as Mark said, most people, including me when I was younger, probably sometimes drank more than you should, and then perhaps drove. But uh, I hope that Phil sticks to his guns and it has to be some type of a saliva test or some test to prove that a person is under the influence of drugs, particularly when they've killed somebody or had a bad accident and could have killed somebody. Saturday morning at about 8.45, there was a friend of mine coming down from Stowe, just this side of uh, the Bear Run Lodge there, this side of the Moscow Turn. Two cars in front of her, car drifted to the left, rolled over on its roof. Maybe he was texting, maybe he was talking on the phone, or maybe he was high from alcohol or marijuana. But uh, it's just one step toward more criminal activity and deaths caused by something that's unnecessary. Okay. Thank you and good luck with your progress with this uh, unfortunate situation. Okay, people. Last thing on the agenda. Manager's compensation. Left, you want to come up? So Skip later sent out a letter interested in forming a committee of one of the Edward Farrar uh, Water D Sewer District members and a couple of the select board. Uh, but I think we could probably get through this tonight with lefties that's here uh, and the board as a whole. Um, typically, you know, in the past, well, Bill, you can probably refresh our memory better than I can as far as uh, last year, um, you got, what, 2%? Yeah. Um, and can you explain a little bit about the, uh, the vehicle status at this point in time, age of the car and yeah, that uh, works with your compensation? So. I've uh, I've been here, as you know, since 1988, and when the uh, when the boards hired me then in, in November of '87, when we came to the agreement that I was going to start here in March, uh, you know, they set my salary, and then they told me that well, we have a a car for the municipal manager to use. Uh, you can use it for your you know. Personal use as well as your as well as your business use, um, unlimited, uh, no restrictions on that use. I, I try not to, you know, drive it to my parents' house in Massachusetts and stuff like that. But um, and I typically use it on the job. But there have been times when uh, my wife has needed our car and I've used it for errands and the like. So I do use it for. Uh, uh, work and personal use. I um, pay taxes on the value of the uh, personal use of it, uh, you know, according to the IRS regulations. Anyway, um, the car was purchased, I believe, in 2009. Eight. I, I sent you something out. 2008. I didn't bring it with me because I didn't know this was going to be talked about tonight. I thought you were just forming a committee. But oh. Okay. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's fine. I well, the way you I, talked last weekend there, we kind of needed to get through it. So I guess I no, I mean, the, the Edward Farrar Commission is appointed lefty at the last meeting, and I thought, you folks said this last time that you were going to appoint your members tonight, but you can do what you want. Um, the car was purchased in 09, left think? 2008, it was. That's right, it says you 2008, okay. And um, 
you know, it's got about 80,000 miles on it, I think, 85, something like that. And it's starting to show a little bit of wear. Um, it's been a good car, uh, but, I, you know, we've already paid more this year for vehicle maintenance than we budgeted because, uh, you know, it was a tough winter and the front end is old and, you know, had about $1,400 worth of, of repairs. And on that memo, I think I kind of calculated out purchase price and went all the way through what's been spent to date. <clears throat> so my point um, was that I'm still driving the car now and there's nothing unsafe about the car. I'm perfectly happy to continue using it for now. If I'm still here when the time comes to replace the car, uh, my recommendation to you would be don't buy another car for the municipal manager. Um, you'll have to compensate me for the fact that you've been supplying me a car all these years. At least that would be my hope because that is part of my compensation. But the reason I say don't buy another car for the manager is because um, more and more the car for me is used for commuting. I drive to work and then I drive home. I go to meetings in Montpelier occasionally. Um, I go to meetings like I had last weekend in St. Albans. But those are few and far between. Um, it's not like the old days, back in the late 80s through the 90s, before we had a public works director. Um, before we had the public works director, uh, the highway foreman, the water and sewer, superintendents, we, there were direct reports to me. Now they report to Bill Woodruff. Bill Woodruff has a truck, he's out, he goes to job sites, he's back and forth outside, uh, all of which I used to do in the car. But now, comes out of my garage in the morning, comes here, sits here until I go home, and then it sits there. And when it comes time to hire the next municipal manager, Either the car will have been sold and I'm still here, or I decide I'm going to retire if you decide that you don't want me to work here anymore and you get rid of the car before you hire somebody else. Because I don't think it makes sense for the manager to have a car anymore. It would be more appropriate for the town, I think, and it would be more of a value for the town if the recreation director had a vehicle. I sometimes when I'm not using it, and Nick, you know, has to drive from here up to um, Hope Davy Field for something, or even, you know, to the ice center or the swimming pool or wherever he's going. Right now, when he goes in his own vehicle, we, we've got to pay him mileage. So if my car is sitting out there and he's not hauling anything, it's just, just take my car and go. We're paying for it already. But uh, it would probably be more appropriate for the recreation department to have a vehicle, uh, whether that would be a vehicle like a pickup truck that is a work vehicle that he can carry things in, or if it was, you know, we're getting to the point now, there's been consideration, some of the business community has talked about having a, like a 12 passenger van that could be used to, you know, take kids on field trips and and some of the summer recreation programs and the after school programs that we're doing. I'm not here to pitch any of that now. I'm just saying that the car for the manager is really not necessary. I'm not willing to just give it up and sell it without being compensated for it. But going forward, you probably ought not to have a vehicle that can be used for personal use for a manager going forward because it's, it's, I don't think it's necessary anymore that way. So anyway, um, you have the memo, I don't. I kind of monetize that over the uh, so I, I know there's years the, worth of time. And I know there's the cost of the vehicle versus miles used. That formula you're suggesting isn't uh, isn't necessarily working anymore because you're driving a lot less than you used to. Um, 
But from a compensation standpoint, I'm just asking this question. Uh, is it, uh, are, would the town save money on, because when we pay somebody more, there's all the other things that have to go with it from a from a, a salary amount or a, a yeah, you, wage amount, like the workman's comp, the unemployment. The, yeah, there'd be, there'd be those things that would have to be paid. You'd pay Social Security on it. You'd, you'd have to pay retirement on that and 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 the the value uh those things are not included in this um you know that's a difficult thing to say chris i think if if you were paying the manager to do a lot of traveling uh outside of the community and you know i served on vlct boards i still serve on a vlct board now um, <clears throat> Uh, and I go to Montpelier for those meetings. Um, but, you know, uh, I used to have to drive to Montpelier to go visit state agencies from time to time. But again, most of those meetings are handled by the public works director right now. Uh, when I go to VLCT meetings, you know, I'm on the, the uh, Vermont um, Employment Resources Board. Um, it's a it's a merged board that used to be the Health Trust, which I was on for 25 years, and uh, the Unemployment Trust. I still serve on that board. I used to be on the VLCT Board of Directors for a long time. I'm not on that anymore. But when, I, when you travel to that, VLCT reimburses you for mileage. So the mileage reimbursement comes in, and that goes in the town coffers because it's the town's vehicle. It's not my vehicle. So it's, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm just saying for, you know, uh, owning a car, there's, there's things about owning a car that you don't think about. Um, and I tried to think about all of them in this memo. You know, there's insurance, there's registration fees, um, then there's maintenance and fuel, of course. Uh, but, you know, don't, don't get too bogged down on that right now. I'm not suggesting that you should sell the car tomorrow and be done with it. From my perspective, you know, I'm hoping to be here at least through the end of the Main Street project if you'll have me. Uh, beyond that, who knows? I don't know what's after that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not looking to go anywhere in the near future on my own volition unless, you know, I'm forced to because the board doesn't want me around anymore. And if, you know, I don't need to drive a brand new car, and this car has 85,000 miles on it. The thing I'm worried about on this car is it's a, it's a hybrid that was bought in 2008. I don't know how much longer the battery that makes the thing run is going to go, and from what I hear, they're pretty expensive. So, well, I'm, I'm trying to look ahead, like after you're gone type thing, uh, and it's suggested or it's been suggested that somebody that might come in to replace you uh, is going to require a lot more money, which I have a difficulty wrapping my arms around that. Somebody just jumping into a new position and making more than the last person has been there for 30 years. Just Happens doesn't, all the time, Chris. doesn't quite make sense. <laughs> Happens all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I just didn't know if, if as a town, we would benefit more by having a vehicle as part of the compensation package. Uh, yeah, you can speak to that, and, Mark. I don't know. And, that much. And, and as I said, if 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 that's something that you're that you're curious about, and you know you, you don't want to make any rash decisions because you think that my analysis may be wrong, that mm -hmm. you may may feel yeah. that it's and cheaper you, to give book car than it is to give seven thousand. Oh, you, you've got time to answer that question because the car is five here, it's seven, running. So I'll keep it. Six Just six before one, one, if that battery goes kablooey, then it's going to cost a pretty penny, and it's probably not worth putting a new battery in it. I think well, be we have off. two, it's anecdotally, but we have two hybrid cars that are 2006 
and they're still going on the same battery. One of them's got 250,000 miles on it. I did have one. We've had like eight or seven hybrids with my daughter involved, and one of them did give up its battery. That was an, an odd one, and it cost, it cost a lot to fix it. Okay. So anyway, Quick, hopefully you'll be oh, okay. Sorry. You, quickly on the vehicle, I think, I mean, kudos to you for keeping a car going for 11 years in Vermont, so. Um, <laughs> You know, if, if you're saying you'd stay through Main Street Reconstruction, um, maybe you can speak to if we did want to make a move on that, it might not, it might not be a bad idea to consider at least doing a three-year lease on a, you know, on a new vehicle, but when you lease, you don't have a lot of the maintenance costs associated with a used vehicle. Um, I just quickly looked up, I, I thought it was a Corolla, so I didn't look at Camry, but a Corolla zero down lease for 10,000 miles a year, which you're, you're way under, is $300 a month. So $3,600 a year is the locked-in price for the cost of the vehicle. That's without a trade-in. So I mean, we could, it could be a couple thousand a year for the next couple years. We'd probably save money to consider that. So I know that we shouldn't really be focused on necessarily the vehicle conversation today, but I think we should talk about that because I think that, uh, you know. Does, when you said you save money on maintenance, uh, sometimes even oil vehicle, changes are included. So yeah. you're yeah. suggesting that the lease that some routine maintenance is covered in the pretty lease. much it's a bumper to bumper warranty through the, the three years. So basically anything you know you would never have to worry about a front end issue or anything like that. It would all be covered under the warranty. I've leased vehicles before, and it does take a lot of those question marks out. And as a municipality with an 11 year old vehicle. How many other 11-year-old cars do we have in, in, the, in the list? So I mean, I think not knowing how long you're going to stay around, I think that's a conversation we should definitely, I think, uh, get ahead, especially if, if we know it's a hybrid and there are some risks associated with continuing to hold that vehicle in our inventory. Um, you know, I think it makes sense to, to consider it. I've leased vehicles before. It really does take a lot of the financial question mark surrounding maintenance out of it completely, which I think would make sense in this scenario. I've, I have my pros and cons about leasing, especially because what you're probably counting is what a traditional personal car would, would cost versus a, you know, this is a municipal vehicle. My personal opinion, I think, I'm a little bit like Bill. I question the need for a car. I probably see the need for a multi-purpose vehicle for town use, you know, where everyone can, it, it sits here, it's not for commuting to work, but when you have a sign-up sheet, if someone needs it one day, you know, that to me makes a lot more sense. It could be used by the recreation director, it could be used by Bill if he has a meeting, so you cover a lot of the, those things. Cars are getting more and more expensive, but if you share that cost over all the different departments, over people needing it rather than paying them mileage, it might be something that might pass. But I, I think the important thing in this scenario is that Bill's had this vehicle, um, as stated in his letter, that there'd be an expectation that if, if we just got rid of the vehicle completely, that um, his compensation should go up, which I think is warranted. So in this scenario, if he's saying that he wants to stay on for a number of years, I think specific to the, the conversation surrounding the vehicle, if we can actually protect ourselves from any kind of large maintenance cost on his vehicle, maybe put him in something that's a little bit newer and, and takes that risk away, you know, we're, we're going to, I think we fairly, we should pay for it the other way if all of a sudden he says, well, I'm just going to go get my own vehicle. This thing's old and um, it's getting to the point where, you know, but I mean, I guess you're not saying that either. So if you're willing to do another year, I guess we can bring this up in a year. But um, I don't know, I think that's, a, that's something that we should talk about for sure. Yeah, maybe for next budget season, we should keep that in mind because We'll be here visiting the same issue again, and by that time, that car will probably be time to head it down the road. And uh, right so now, the book value on it's about six thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Really? It's almost two years. Uh, yeah. Lease payments. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually Bill, it's five to seven, so figure halfway in between. Well, I mean, uh, if you could trade it in and get five thousand dollars and put it towards a 
uh, a new car. I kind of like Mike's idea about a multi, kind of multi-purpose that you could sign up for and take it to a meeting when you need to. But, and I agree, maybe you know, compensate you for that loss of that benefit. But I, I've leased a car, and it's fine until you, um, until I hit a snowbank. Um, some place that had some hidden object in it, <laughs> and suddenly had a little damage under the front. And when I went to trade it in, you know, they were really happy to charge me quite a bit of money to make that car whole. So, if you had multiple drivers on it, that wouldn't be so good either. So anyway. And Bill, you are very lucky because I know some of the cars vintage you have that needed a battery change up to the cost of nine thousand dollars so you probably you probably if you're going to need new batteries you're going to jump the car i'll make a motion to trade the vehicle in tomorrow <laughs> i don't hear a second so we'll <laughs> um, so our think about yeah we're getting into the weeds currently we have a uh, I think we've got a 2% increase on the table. Um, is there any argument for or against anything different at this point? Well, it seems to be consistent with the cost of living that's on the attachment, and I just looked it up myself before we started talking about it. Um, so it seems like a reasonable amount to me. And the EFUD group uh, was looking for 2% plus keep the car. Hopefully that that would be. Yeah, Bill, can you explain how that relationship works? I know, um, I think the village used to have a certain amount of, or I don't know if it was just a payment to the town, but I was just wondering if you could explain how your compensation works. Yeah, so uh, nothing really has changed from the transition from uh, EFUD from the village. So I'm a town employee. I receive my paycheck from the town of Waterbury and in the town's general government budget there's a regular pay line and uh, I'm included in that regular pay line for general government. So uh, Pam and Karen and Beth Jones and myself and uh, Michelle, uh, the bookkeeper, uh, Michelle Ryan, uh, we're, we make up the general government. Carl is an elected official, so there's a separate line item in the general government for her. Um, so anyway, I, my pay and benefits are all included in the town's general government budget. And then um, in 2019, the district is paying the town $98,000 for its share of all of that general government uh, service. So, you know, Karen is the utility billing clerk in addition to the tax clerk, and and they all, you know, they all answer uh, district questions like they answer village questions. So um, is there's that a percentage. There's kind of a there's kind of a formula. Uh, last year, the commissioners asked me to um, to do a little bit of a time study. So I had Carla and. Uh, Karen and Pam and Michelle keep track of the hours that they worked for the village or for the district. Um, I put, uh, I, I, I keep track of mine as well. I think they asked me, they didn't think we reduced the, the amount enough. Um, if you remember this budget season, the EFUD commissioners and the select board didn't have a joint meeting. Uh, I proposed that I can't remember what it was last year, maybe $110,000 the village paid. Right, we only dropped it. And we dropped it down to 98. The select board put it in the budget. They accepted it and said, we'd like a little bit more analysis for next year. But that's how it happens. It's and the pay is out of the town budget and the you know, district. And the ratio course. will vary from year to year depending on what activities are going on. Yeah, I guess my question on that, that is, even though that might change year to year, is that time tracking taking up your time or is it really rather like it's, i guess at some point can we just say it levels out and we settle settle on a percentage and we don't have to like think about it every yeah, year and, and, then. And, and we did that um there used to be a, a rather complex formula you know i can't remember it but it was the district or the village paid like 40 percent of my pay they paid 
sixty percent of the bookkeeper, and you know there was a, there were a lot of moving parts to that formula, and of course, you know the. The pay lines were going up incrementally a couple of percent a year at the most, so that formula wasn't changing much. So at some point, I proposed just that. I said, can we just call this the base, and then from now on, we'll just raise it by the cost of living, and everybody agreed to that. So um, I keep track right now. It's pretty easy once I built a spreadsheet. It's got about you know 25 different columns of things that I spend my time on. And, uh, I'll keep that for the year and see what it looks like. Okay. You have any argument one way or another on the two percent bill? Uh, no, I think that's uh, that's reasonable. Um, it's it's within the range that we talked about before. I did uh, I did let you know in this memo that the retirement plan that I'm on um, is not the contribution the employer is making isn't changing. I'm on a uh, defined contribution plan where I don't get a traditional pension like most of the people do. Uh, back in 2008, I think it was, those two pension plans were the same. Uh, this is on the second page. Uh, uh, for the defined benefit plan, which most of our employees are on, that started at 5% and I was at 5.125. Um, and in 2013, uh, the DB plan started to uh, increase while my plan stays at 5.125 for the foreseeable future. So the DP, DB plan rate uh, went to 5.25% in 13. It's now uh, 5.625 on July 1st this year. It's going to be 5.75. July 1st, 2020, it's going to be 6%. And in 2021, it's going to be 6.25%. So while my, the contribution that you're putting into my retirement is staying at the 5.125, you're paying a high percentage for everybody else incrementally going up. So, uh, but. Who's setting those um, rate? That's set and that's a rate me. allowance that basically you can put in that much of your salary and. No, um, so we have uh, when we hire a new employee. So I just hired a new employee for the wastewater treatment plant. I just hired a new employee for the library. Um, offered them jobs. Uh, we are mandatory participants in the Vermont Employees Retirement System. Um, and we, as the town of Waterbury, offer two plans. There's, I think there's five different plans that you can choose. It's an irrevocable decision if you decide that you're going to go on the defined benefit plan, which is a traditional pension plan, and I think that would be something like um, you get, uh, like, I think it's 1.8 percent of credit for the number of years you work. So if you work 10 years, you're at 18% of your average final compensation. If you work 20 years, you're at 36%. It's, it's capped, that plan uh, is capped at 60% of your average final compensation. You can retire when you're 55. So if you get hired you know, right out of high school and you're 18 or 20 years old and you work until you're 65, you're going to get 60% of your average final compensation. The defined contribution plan is a plan, um, it's much more like a 401k where the employer set, there's a defined contribution that goes in from me and the employer. It's 5.125% for both, um, or it's 5, 5 for me and 5.125 for the employer. I get 5. The, 0.125 is used for administration. But these uh, percentages are all set by uh, the state legislature um, with the advice of the state treasurer. So what they're saying is that we've made a promise to the defined benefit people, and in order to keep up with the actuarial tables, we've got to increase either the employer share or the employee share. And usually they go after the employer share because some of the employees have unions and they don't want to pay more. Uh, so they raise the employer share. 
Whereas the defined contribution plan that I'm on, the money goes in and it's directed by me. I invest it the way I want it invested and you know, if I grow it to $3 million by the time I retire, great. If I you know, do a terrible job and, and lose everything when the market crashes and I end up with $200,000 in it at the end of my career, well, that's what I get, so anyway. Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, increase the manager's compensation by 2%. Second the motion. Do I need to state over what period of time does that? Um, well, for everybody else, uh, their pay increase was effective uh, the week ending April 6th. So you can either say it starts at the end of this week or you can make it retroactive. That's can I just make it retroactive for fiscal year 2019? Uh, or we would make it retroactive to the week ending April 6th. I'll make it, uh, I'll make the motion to be retroactive for, uh, to the week ending April 6th. I would second that. Are any further discussion? Uh, I have a question. So if it's April 6th, why should we then be discussing this concept earlier in April? We, sh we should have done that. I think that's <laughs> not so my, so, so Should it be what, on the agenda What we time? usually do, I mean, mm -hmm. years ago what happened was, you know, the boards and I would make some decisions and then money would get in the budget. and. You know, the board would say, well, you know, we'll have an across the board raise of 2%. Uh, and they gave me a little bit of discretion to reward some people who did things that were extraordinary. Uh, then I came back to them and said, you know, if you give an across the board raise all the time, the higher paid people get further ahead of the lower paid people because 2% of my pay is a lot more dollars than 2% of somebody who's making you know, half of what I make. So anyway, um, I got uncomfortable with signing my own raise, and I've asked the board to do it. It's been on the agenda a couple times, and it got busy. And uh, so, yes, it would be nice if it happened earlier, but we go through deal. budget time, and then everybody's just like, don't have to think about numbers anymore, including me. So. Okay. Yeah, well, actually, maybe, maybe it's better because now we have a little bit of a wall and we can have a real discussion about it. I mean, in this, in this case, make, making it retroactive, you, you're made whole again. Right. So I'm it's not, yeah. Like, I, yeah. Okay. I'm not, I'm not Just a question. No, I was, I was kind of speaking to Jane's point. Yeah. Um, okay. So, motion been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 Um, on another note, perhaps for next year, I don't know if that's something that we would have to do or you could help us out with as far as um, whatever comes about next year as far as compensation for you, how a vehicle or a no vehicle would play into whatever additional uh, would be required to compensate for the lack of a vehicle and or to Mark's point, a lease and how that might yeah, so I'll, fit in for the rest of the duration that you're... I'll try to get some information. Uh, you know, I, I certainly can get information about the, the lease at any point. And, you know, if Lefty's right and my car is worth more than the lease, you could sell, you know, you, it wouldn't have a budget impact. You could, you could lease it in 2019 and just tell the voters we sold that car before it, you know, needed Wonderful. some real big money and we replaced it with this lease. So I can get that information and if we decide not to do that, then I can follow up, you know, if we decide to sell it and not have it. Um, so anyway. Yeah, give us some options. Good. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, that's it for tonight, fellas. One question. Sure. Why we're uh, in the subject of wages, do we have any employees that are under what they, they, they call a livable wage under $15 an hour? 
Uh, some of our seasonal employees, so uh, lifeguards, uh, day camp employees, they're all making at least the current minimum wage. Most of them are higher than that. Um, typically, um, for regular full first year employees. people, you know, when we, when we hire first year people for those seasonal jobs, they may be hired at minimum wage, but then after that it makes up. Um, as far as full-time employees or, or permanent employees, I would say uh, they're all above $15 an hour. Okay, that's what I thought. Thanks. All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. A second? Second. Anybody have any further discussion? Comments? Good enough. We're done.